I'm really grateful to be invited here. It's a great honour to speak to uh, a uh, critical discourse analysis conference. Uh, I've for a, long, for a long time seen myself as a bit of a critical discourse analyst w without ever like using capital letters. But uh, I've certainly been very happy to be critical of all sorts of things, including mainstream psychology and uh, various kinds of political organisations and so on. And uh, today I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether I'm going to manage to offend everyone in the audience in one way or another, but, but we'll find out that it goes well. So I'm going to leave plenty of time at the end for questions and comments. What I want to do is give a very thumbnail picture of, and it's kind of a personal one in, in some respects, of where I've come to with respect to some kind of project that one might call discursive psychology. And it's, in some respects, it builds on that work that Margaret Rutherall and I did in the 1980s. But in other respects, it's quite a strong departure from that work, and we'll see some of those features in a minute. So let me start off with a couple of things. Also, if I go, I know there's a lot of second language English speakers in the audience. If I tend to gabble, get overexcited, just tell me to slow down and I'll slow down. I'm happy to do that. Um, okay, Loughborough. Uh, well, we're here. It turns Loughborough the other important place in the UK, I think. For, um, Lowbrow, as uh, Greg Myers from uh, Texas calls it, Lowbrow University, with official Texan pronunciation. Uh, I work with a, uh, what you might call an interdisciplinary team who uh, are fantastically exciting set of people uh, and uh, I've been very privileged to work with them for some time now, uh, uh, where I can point to this. Michael Billing, of course, uh, well known to many people here for his critical work on ideology, nationalism, racism, the National Front and so on. Uh, Liz. Stoke over here and in the middle at the top you can you can see that we all work really really hard <laughs> we're all pouring over data there analyzing it as we go along uh, Liz Stoke is one of the foremost workers at the boundary of feminism and conversation analysis currently Charles Antarki uh, another close colleague who works on conversation analysis disability argumentation uh, Sue Wilkinson up in the middle, directly above, who's moved from being one of the founders of feminist social psychology in the UK to a strong proponent of conversation analysis. And over here, Derek Edwards, uh, one of the other uh, founders of discursive psychology, whose work, uh, Discourse and Cognition, probably many of you know his 1997 book being looked at adoringly by Malcolm Ashmore, who's probably best known at the University of Bogota now, rather than uh, uh, Loughborough, and uh, Alexa Hepburn, who's here in the audience, who uh, has instigated the kind of programming work of which I'm going to be talking a bit about today. So, we work in a very collaborative way. What I'm going to say it isn't the official party line, we all have a lot of disagreements with each other, we admire and respect disagreements uh, and see them as part of doing good work. But nevertheless, I'd like to pay tribute to those people as what keeps me, uh, keeps me sane and uh, busy. Okay, so how are we going to do it? I'm just trying to remember you're okay with that. Um, a little bit of history, I think. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit of history. I'm going to talk about some features of discursive psychology, and, and then I'm just going to take a very broad brush illustration. Okay, let me start off with a definition. Not perfect by any means, but a useful definition of discursive psychology, which is an approach which treats psychology as an object in and for interaction. Okay, now I've put an asterisk next to psychology. Um, 
and I'm going to put an asterisk next to some other terms that I'm going to use, just to indicate that part of this project is a project of re-specification. It's not a project of classic psychology, but it's a project of moving psychology around a bit, of changing the way it looks and its shape. I say an object, one could go through and complain about each of these words. An object, a set of objects, things, stuff. In interaction, that is, starting off with considering how psychological matters appear and become live in interaction. And that interaction is not uh, necessarily face-to-face -face interaction, but telephone interaction, interaction using texts and documents, new media, and so on, a wide range of things. And also for interaction, that is about the business of getting things done. And increasingly, a lot of what we're doing uh, at Loughborough is looking at practices which often have uh, some kind of institutional basis um, and looking at how that institutional work gets done. Okay, now, through the 1980s, one of the things that I did a lot of the time um, was work with open-ended qualitative interviews. And, and indeed, that seemed to be one of the most exciting things to do at the time. And this was part of a of a very strong debate with mainstream social cognitive psychology. It was before social cognition was actually really invented as a term by, uh, uh, that's probably about 94 or something like that, but that came to be the official language for it. But anyway, one of the things we were countering was that kind of work. However, since the early 1990s, I've got very dissatisfied with using qualitative interviews, with that style of work. And that dissatisfaction has two elements to it. One is a, a, like a critical element of considering the way open-ended interviews operate, the business within them, and in a sense, the most recent expression of that critique is uh, a debate that Alexa Hepburn and I had with uh, a range of people, proponents of qualitative interviews like Elliot Mishler, Jonathan Smith, and uh, Wendy Holloway. Um, and I think this is probably on your handout somewhere. Highlighting not, not that qualitative interviews can't be done or they're, they're not interesting, but how enormously difficult they are to analyse effectively. That they are really very, very complicated social occasions and much of the work doing analysis of those sorts of things is inattentive to the kind of social, indication, social occasion and its organisation. However, I think the stronger motivation for me has been the fascination of looking at, working with, records of stuff happening. Initially, Derek Edwards and I were looking at journalistic disputes and news interviews, tracking through particular social events, how they appeared day by day in newspaper articles, television stories, uh, interviews with politicians and so on. But more recently, uh, we've been working with other kinds of materials. Uh, Alexa and I have been working a lot on helpline materials, and we're going to be talking a bit about that. Uh, and even more recently still, we've been doing something which is kind of brings us around full circle to where a lot of social psychologists started to go in the 1960s, which is to work with video materials of family interaction. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about that here, although I'm happy to in question time. 
And one of the excitements about that, of looking at police interrogations, of, talking, of looking at neighbour disputes, looking at, uh, actually we were at a meeting in uh, uh, Newcastle last week, where we were looking, and this is an arm too, but we were looking at video of people being tasered, uh, which was shocking and interestingly organised, but anyway. We've been working with these kind of materials, and one interesting thing is, uh, well, let, let me pause for a moment. Uh, in psychology, as, as people, some people here know, I'm often known as the person who hates empiricism, uh, and is the, one of the authors of Death and Furniture, the kind of relativist manifesto, uh, interested in uh, sociology of science and that kind of thing. And I'm very happy with that, <laughs> that reputation. Uh, and not trying to go back on it at all. However, one of the interesting things to me, as a, well, a sophisticated person understanding uh, sociology of science and the history of science, is when you look at mainstream psychology and its evolution, one thing you find is that the natural history approach never really got off the ground. There was never a kind of moment where there was a kind of Darwinian impulse. Probably the closest, uh, for those of you who have a kind of bit of a historical bent on it, would be the work by Roger Barker in the 50s and 60s, which was a kind of Skinnerian behavioural inspired study of a small town in, uh, in the Midwest of the States where they sent out rather overweight guys with checklists ticked. Yes. There are other sorts of elements, some of the work uh, in activity theory has come part way to this. But what struck me over the last decade is, is that the people who really engaged with interaction, in a, in a sense of looking at what's going on interaction, have been conversation analysts, people from within sociology with that kind of uh, perspective. And of course, uh, traditionally those aren't people who are particularly associated with critical matters. Although more recently, as some of you may know, within feminist thinking, People like Celia Kitzinger, Elizabeth Stokoe, Susan Spear have pressed the importance of conversation analysis as an approach that can help us address questions of feminism. So, what am I saying here? What I'm saying is that there's a real interest for discourse researchers to work with records of stuff, records of police interrogations, of child protection interviews, of helpline interaction, of medical interaction, and so on. There are important things going on that one can be stimulated by, can help one think about critical questions, and indeed can engage with the kinds of issues that psychologists have engaged with in other kinds of ways. Now, of course, this isn't only a kind of empiricist move, a move towards looking at stuff, although that is a pretty important part of it. Also, that move is stimulated by a consideration about how interaction operates. And I guess, you know, this, this is really back of the envelope stuff, but the way I would characterise it in very simplistic terms would be if you take the kind of Wittgensteinian critique of what my, you know, what my more pretentious colleagues would call interiority, um, the way in which that critique considers, for example, the language of psychology in terms of language games and practices, and then looks at the work of someone like Harvey Sachs, or my colleague Derek Edwards, I think, of taking that vision, 
but applying it analytically to considering how <coughs> psychological stuff gets done and the way it is used to get things done. What one has is a kind of empirical discipline that is, you know, it's a discipline working with stuff guided by a different kind of theoretical backdrop. And in particular, the Saxian vision highlights how people, when they're talking to one another, are building their issues of common understanding, world, what the world is, as they're going along in a moment-by-moment -moment way. That is, that kind of perspective provides a sequential location of things. And that has been enormously powerful, I think. Again, it's not been massively popular within critical discourse work. Conversation analysts are often seen as the kind of micro, somewhat conservative with a small c people. Uh, and I've come to, uh, uh, to, to think that that is pretty unjustified, that there is enormous power in that approach. So within discursive psychology, one of the things that we're doing is looking at the way descriptions, other kinds of things are orientated to action. And we've got these three kinds of situation, three kinds of situations. And these highlight the value of working with records of interaction primarily, rather than working immediately with texts or other kind of forms, and we can have that discussion afterwards. Am I going at the right kind of pace? Or should I be going a bit faster or slower? Is this okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I sometimes think I'm just chatting away and, you know, I'm the only one enjoying it really, but never mind. <laughs> um, okay, three kinds of situation. There's one kind of situation in this, which is the one that conversation analysts have highlighted. People like Sachs, Shegloff, Gail Jefferson, who sadly died uh, earlier this year. Where the situation is, is within a strip of interaction that any turn of talk sets up but does not constrain in the sense of force what comes next. That is, it's an approach which is radically, on the one hand, looking at normative structures, but on the other hand, is able to encompass contingency, the kind of thing that the psychological work, the analysis of variance, the kind of perspective, struggles a bit with. And I should say here um, that I'm not someone who has a kind of neurotic aversion to analysis of variance. One of my uh, roles at Loughborough is to teach statistics, uh, which I enjoy, and I think it's very important. Uh, so I'm not by any means an anti-statistics person. I'm not indeed a Denzel and Lincoln type, wave the flag for qualitative research type person. I'm equally happy with quantitative or qualitative work. It's the theoretical coherence and possibly the political interest of that work that's crucial to me. A second kind of situation, which I think is a really interesting one for psychologists, is that we're interested in the way that discourse is situated institutionally. One of the things that you find if you look through the classic social psychology textbooks which arrive for free on my desk, you know, a huge pile, Baron and Byrne or uh, Diane Mackey's new book or whatever, uh, is that their vision of social structure is a very abstract vision of kind of variables located in some kind of conceptual space. It isn't a vision, and this is to do with the history of American social psychology, of course, but more than that, to do with the way theorising in those disciplines has developed. It isn't a vision that addresses the organisation 
of institutions. It doesn't pick out institutionality as a structuring role, as a structuring form for discourse. It's quite uncomfortable with that. And indeed, it's, in many ways, it's, it's, its aim is to wipe that out, to clear that away, to produce a, an abstract set of processes that operate over and above, you know, a master set of processes. And I think one of the interesting things that, again, conversation analysis in that move towards considering institutionality and normativity has done is highlight the extraordinary complex way in which discourse works, not just within institutions, but actually how institutions are reproduced and take their normative organisation through these structures. And finally, a third level or kind of vector of situation um, comes from the kind of interest in the work that I've grown up with, if you like, as a kind of colleague and friend from McBilly, that kind of rhetorical perspective where one sees that a relevant situation for descriptions is the kind of things they work against. And of course his classic work on the royal family, for example, as part of a critique of individualistic psychological attitude theorising, he highlights the way in which notions of attitude breed within situations of conflict or argument and the way in which that problematic shouldn't be understood in terms of kind of inner positions, but in terms of the kind of debates, arguments, conflicts, and so on. Enormously powerful, enormously important work for highlighting the way in which politics is inscribed within texts, within interaction, and so on. And finally, Discursive psychology, psychology is both constructed and constructed. That is, in the kind of contemporary language we might talk about action formation, the building of complaints, of compliments, of criticisms, or flirtation, or whatever. Action formation depends upon the drawing upon of various kinds of resources, including words, various kinds of idioms, metaphors, I know we had a lot of metaphor in this room earlier on, uh, various kinds of rhetorical commonplaces, possibly broader discourses or interpretive repertoires. Those kind of things are put together in the formation of actions within settings situated in these three ways. And those things, those actions, are also, and often at the same time, and often reflexively dependent upon, I can't believe I said that sentence, and I'm, I'm just in brackets, aren't I? Anyway, dependent upon descriptions of things like social organisations, histories, institutions, mental states, emotional feelings, and so on. Okay, so that provides a kind of a grid, if you like, for discursive psychology, a pattern to which one can fit in the various, really quite large body of work that's gone on in the last uh, 15 or so years since uh, discursive psychology as a book was produced. And this provides a backdrop for respecification of the kind of primary language of psychology, things like memory, attribution, scripts, attitudes, categories, if you like, if you could go through the, the textbook chapters, reworking them in terms of this praxeological approach, this approach inspired by Wittgensteinian Saxian thinking. And so that's the way to understand that sweep of work as part of this broad focus on respecifications. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm wanting to press this on a bit because I want to make sure that I leave at least 10 minutes for questions at the end and I want to talk about some materials as well. 
All right, just some analytic themes. Discursive psychologists have been interested in, if you like, the psychological implications of talk. So, for example, they've been interested in the way a description might be put together as a record of something that happened, which might traditionally be called a memory, if you like, because operationally speaking, uh, remembering you know, comes into psychology through people producing descriptions of what happened. And of course our early work, Derek Evans and I early work, where we engage with people like Ulrich Neiter and so on, talking about the way remembering can be rethought in terms of how descriptions are used to build blamings and complaints. That is bringing together that kind of classic cognitive psychological perspective with a focus on attribution theory and the way responsibility is, has been assigned. But looking at that by focusing on descriptions and descriptions appearing in naturalistic settings. And if you look at the attributional literature, uh, there's a big literature on attributions, but you won't find studies of that kind. You won't find it unfolding in that way, or you'll find two or three which we've commented on. There is interesting stuff on language categories and its involvement in attribution, and there's a long-standing critical debate with that kind of work that you might be interested in. There's also a focus on psychology as display, the way anger, upset, and so on, are things which are inflected in interaction through raised voice, for example, through quivery or querulous voice, and the way in which, if we remember the kind of grid earlier, the way in which those things are situated as parts of activities within strips of action, often within institutional settings, often managing different rhetorical business. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in an example. We've also looked at the psychological thesaurus, the way words like angry and upset, very interestingly distinct things, appear in an engaged, embodied way within interaction, not part of a, of a vignette, not as a, like an abstract feature of cognitive processes, but as a particular, as parts of particular practices like complaints and hours and so on. Psychology and institutions, <coughs> we've been very interested in the way psychological practices become used for institutional practices, the way different kinds of institutions, for example, use things like um, Take an, uh, take an example, um, well, use things like complaints or criticisms and so on, the way in which the form of those kinds of things may be built into a police interrogation, for example, or the way in which other kinds of practices to do with avowals and sincerity are built into therapeutic interaction. And finally, and I think very importantly, we've been looking reflexively at the methods used by social scientists and the, the way those methods are intera themselves interactionally organised. Notably qualitative interviews, but also focus groups and systematic surveys. And I think there's an increasingly interesting literature to be had there. Okay. All right, let, let me just end up with, a, with an example then. Uh, Alexa Hepburn and I have been working for a number of years now uh, with the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty for Two Children. Um, and we have, uh, you know, I could talk a lot about the, you know, the political and applied elements of the program, but I want to just note some aspects about uh, 
that material and in particular an example to just illustrate the kind of things I've been saying. Um, for those of you who don't know it, the NSPCC is the, uh, Britain's largest child protection charity, even larger since it amalgamated with Childline a couple of years ago. Um, it gets way in excess of a quarter of a million calls a year, and it's legally mandated to refer on to the police or social services, mainly social services, any information upon which there is good grounds that a child is at risk and can be helped. Pretty tricky judgments, these things. And they get a, a wide range of calls from all over the country of people with different ethnic backgrounds, regional accents, social class backgrounds, and so on. I just want to take a fragment of one to give some examples. Now, we didn't get the audio going on this, and it's not a bad thing. I have turned this into a pretty Mickey Mouse piece of audio. Uh, I'll just try it. Um, but what I want to do is take the transcript of this. Everyone want to have the handout, is that right? Um, so I'll going to do something which I'm actually really poor at, which is kind of reading it out. Um, and I'm just going to do a bit because, I, like I said, I want to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. This is a call uh, where the oh okay I thought something really exciting was going to happen. He's going to say that's enough of that. We're not going to have any more of this stuff. <laughs> um, this is a call where a mother, a distressed mother, is calling about a very difficult daughter who's causing a lot of disruption at home, a lot of trouble with her um, siblings. Now the child protection officers have all have three years field child protection experience and that they are expected to work with, that is that they aren't trained in a, in a script or they're not like NHS direct working with a kind of, you know, a, a, an online system of prompts. What they're doing is using their field skills. And one of those field skills is they know what social services will or won't be able to do. As we know, those of us living in the UK, social services are underfunded, high, highly pressured, and often firefighting difficult cases. And so the judgment is often made that a case like this, which is a, an unhappy case, is not one where social services will step in in the way that mother asked, which is to uh, take the daughter into care. And the child protection officer pushes a line of advice, which is basically to get the mother or to get a uh, family therapy that she needs to get help, she needs to engage with the daughter, she needs to take time off work, and so on. The mother has a different kind of agenda, if you like, and is pushing the importance of someone else looking after the daughter. Okay, now, let, let me just do the first 20 lines of this. Okay, CPO, your observation officer, right, would it not be possible for you to maybe take some leave while she's living with you? Cool. I've only just started this job. I mean, it's possible, you know, right? I'd be unpaid. I'm just starting a new mortgage, right? Right. You know, it's uh, yeah. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's about priorities, isn't it? And you know, obviously, she's uh, got to come first in all this because she's and yeah, and you get all disagreement on that. Now, what I'm not able to show you in this paper, uh, in the time, is the regular patterning of such things uh, where you've got advice resistance and child protection officers increasingly come to package the advice in particular ways. But note here 
on line 16, uh, you've got a, an advice form, a kind of, if you like, a declarative form. It's about priorities. And that's a lovely one. It can be read, let, let me go quick and dirty on this, it can certainly be read as potentially somewhat critical of the idea that the mother is paying attention to her mortgage rather than her daughter. Right? These are the kind of priorities. That becomes more explicit a bit later on. But note what we've got preceding it. I want to just note the way in which we can start to think about knowledge as something interaction. You've got what you might call a common knowledge builder, the kind of thing that Derek Edwards talks about in Discourse and Cognition. You know, line 15. And then you have something really interesting, which is this declarative, it's about priorities, is, if you like, idiomatic formulated. At the end of the day, right? it's produced as an idiom. Right? These are very recognisable kind of things. Uh, Drew and Holmes and others have shown that idioms are both hard to, hard to rebut, like a billig also, hard to undermine. They don't have qualities that lend to easy undermining. We can talk about why that is. And they also, as Drew and Holmes have shown rather nicely, tend to appear in terminal settings, normally, often, where you have a complaint sequence where you've got a lack of affiliation. Often this is rounded off by the complainer using an idiom and then doing topic change. Okay, so it's an interesting like transitional element to this, moving the caller on, child church officer. Now, okay, so we've got one kind of knowledge there and the you know common knowledge builder. We've got a different one with the tag question in line 16. It's about priorities, isn't it? Right? Now, as we all know, acres of work done on tag questions, mainly from sociolinguists looking at their distributional patterns with respect to social categories. But here, what this is doing as an interrogative is treating the recipient as in a position to confirm this. You know, it, it's in conversation analytic language, it prefers an agreement. Now, this is just fascinating because what you've got is someone who's resisted for five, six minutes now a particular uh, course of action and they're being rebuilt, redesigned as someone who's already on board with the basics, basis of that form of action. And note also some features of how this works. You've got this latching, and you know, there's another common knowledge builder and a production of self-evidence, obvious. They run on to the next thing, holding off the caller's response to that. Now, I say a lot more about that, and indeed some of the things which are on, you know, the publications on the third page of this, explore the operation of this kind of stuff in a lot more detail, particularly the piece that uh, Alexa Hepburn and I have written. Um, and, uh, uh, interrogating tears, tag questions of the child protection helpline. But the interesting thing here is the way the knowledge is being considered in terms of its practical ways not just in the use of the kind of mental thesaurus of, of no, but the way in which that appears sequentially, the way the recipient is treated as knowing something, able to agree something, the way their knowledge becomes interactionally live as part of this project. Okay, now, what I'm not going to do is try and go through the same kind of thing with uh, the upset that appears Next in this call, in a sense, you can, if you like, rebuild that part from the uh, boxes and arrows in the um, the rest of the transcript. It's uh, a kind of little homework exercise for everyone to take away and rebuild another 15 minutes of talk out of the uh, transcript. Uh, but if you look at some of the papers on crime, 
And in particular, Alexia Hepburn's paper and research on language and social interaction, on crime, issues of description and transcription and action, you can see the way that something which has been treated overwhelmingly in psychology, ironically, in terms of questionnaire responses about when do you cry and when do your children cry, the two, the overwhelmingly the research is done using two crying inventories, using abstract categories for crime, particular kind of linguistic forms. I'm, I'm just trying to push the irony here. And yet us, often treated as the non-empirical, rather kind of quasi-constructionist relativist people, <laughs> taking recordings of actual upset, all these categories are moral, political categories which themselves unpack, actual upset in actual situations, looking at how they are organised interaction. Uh, and I think that's an extraordinary, massively extraordinary state of affairs. But I'm just going to stop. I think I'll leave, you know, ten, ten minutes for, for um, whatever, questions, comments. For Taylor to finally get to thinking, you yeah, know, you, what you're saying is, uh, or, or whatever. Like to start discussion with questions, comments. I just stopped so suddenly that no one's prepared, are they? But, 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 yes. <laughs> I just have a small question hmm. to the data because hmm. you stopped very abruptly. Very um, on this thing. <laughs> and uh, my question would be um, what happens with the advice? this agency gives this caller. Well, obviously, I've just skimmed mm. through it. Uh, it's a very difficult case. It's mm. obvious and so forth. And there's sort of back and forth mm. because she needs to earn money and so she can't mm. do this and that. Mm. So all this is quite apparent in the text. So what happens afterwards? Is she prepared to take up the advice? In what way would this service, this person need to talk to such people to make them accessible for advice? Mm -hmm. Is this something you can sort of get out of such texts? Do you provide them then with, with some recommendations or anything? Or what's, what's the result of this research? Okay, a lovely question. Um, let, let me take two elements of, of that. One, in terms of the upshot, the NSPCC itself is not for these kind of calls able to follow up. Okay? What we have is, as is very common for institutional studies, that advice is delivered and the success of delivery is treated internally. And so, so if one looks at Heritage and Sefi's work on uh, British health visitors, for example, or David Silverman's work on HIV, AIDS, counselling, what you see is, is the recipient of the advice either resisting or displaying that they're taking it on board. Now that isn't the same as being able to you know, get in your car and follow them down the road and do that. But I think that's a very interesting question. Right? But no one answers that question. Okay? So, I, I'm interested that it's not answered. But I, what I want to say is that I don't think that another approach answers that question. It might well be that one could collect material of that kind. It isn't institutionally collected. Institutionally, the NSPCC uh, will collect records on its referrals. Those are a different class of things. But for callers who call in once, there is no provision. Right? And this is, remember, this is a firefighting organisation as well, dealing with more calls than they can deal with after the tsunami swamps by not enough money for dealing with this stuff. So, so that, that, that's one element. With respect to the other element, our vision of application for this work 
is one where we provide enabling tools. Right? We don't think that we are better able to understand what goes on than the child protection officers. What we have is a interestingly different description. And that provides something which is, they find very interesting. And it's very interestingly different from the common teaching materials, which often are uh, normatively organized, somewhat speech hacked, somewhat psychodynamic, somewhat role acting versions of what it's like. They aren't based upon the apparent messiness, but actual, extraordinarily complicatedly, intricately, architecturally brilliantness of the actual course. Uh, so it's a providing a resource job, is the, I'm, I'm ranting here, but those are the two kind of things. Alright, we have uh, time for some more questions, please. Excellent, Jonathan. Yes. Yeah. about the data with a the theoretical mm. question after that. Um, in the comments in the margin, number one is common knowledge. And in your re-specification, mm. you said, I don't talk about memory and so on and so on. Mm. So I suppose when you talk about common knowledge, the topic I'm going to talk about tomorrow, you don't mean really knowledge in the cognitive sense, but formulations of knowledge, right? I mean that it is a interactionally local piece of building what both parties know in common. Yes. Right? But, but you're right, it isn't common knowledge in that sense that you, that you are suggesting. And of course you know that, yeah, this is, but I'm getting ahead of myself, yeah? So what do you do if, according to your own re-specification, things obviously understood by the participants mm. are not actually formulated. So for example, in the middle of this uh, fragment which begins in 15, mm. you know, you mean, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's about priorities, isn't it? Obviously, she's got to come first, and then she says, I know. First of all, we have to explain why she says, I know, yes, yes, and, yes. and then um, she has to come first in all of this, because she's, and he doesn't finish, or she doesn't mm. finish. Now, your data doesn't tell what the people understand, but she in the next turn says, yes, or yeah, but if I've got, and so on. So I've got that work. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you do with things which are obviously understood by the participants, which any person participating mm -hmm. in this conversation would understand as such, but is not actually formulated as such? What do you do with the rules of specification when these things are simply implied, presupposed, tacitly understood as such and such. What do you do with all these non-observables? Well, I've got two answers to this. Yes. Uh, one of the answers is I'll ask Taylor, because he's an expert on that stuff. <laughs> and, and, you know, and that's his business, as it were, the behind-the-backs business, you know, the kind of underlying stuff that goes on. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm not unsympathetic to that idea that, that there is an interesting enterprise However, and obviously there's going to be a bit of a however here, when you take the I know there, uh, the avowal of that, what that does practically in this setting is it neutralizes the critical element of that and provides the start of further resistance to the advice. Uh, so one can carry on, I mean, you know, all I've done is it, not really analytic, it's just some observations about that, uh, the way in which the child protection officer is building a response to advice resistance. But the next analytic step is to look at how further resistance to those responses to advice resistance gets done. And indeed that I know in first position, rather like when you get, uh, you know, in Pomerantz's work uh, work with uh, disagreements, you often get a, a pro forma agreement first, I know yes, right and then you go on to disagree. So, for me, I would first say, let's look at how this is working in terms of the practices here, and it may indeed be that there are there is something somewhere that one might call um, you know, cognitive or whatever, uh, which underlies this or goes along with it. 
But my uh, start point would always be with what we have and how that's organised and how the intricacy of the activities are organised. And I would think that, that there, once you've got that, you'll have a better handle on this other stuff or you might find that what you thought was the other stuff isn't there. Okay, well, uh, thank you. We have time for one more question, I think. Or comment, possibly. Well, in, in that case, uh, allow me to thank Jonathan once more for an uh, exciting talk. And before you rush off, I have one.